Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Two Guys in a Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. Uh, William Bell is sitting right over there uh, trying to get his microphone to work. (laughs) Uh, We were talking just fine, and then all of a sudden his microphone started messing up. I could hear one channel of it, and then all of a sudden it went on the blink as well. Uh, so we're certainly hoping that he gets his microphone back online because we got some really good stuff to talk about tonight. But it's good to be back with you. Of course, uh, uh, we were not with you for Christmas and the New Year's. I took some time off, went to Arkansas, visited with my grandkids, uh, my daughter and son-in-law. And uh, had a really, really good time over there. Very enjoyable time. And uh, got back and someone asked me earlier uh, when I got back, they said, well, did you enjoy just kick back doing nothing? And I said, well, I didn't do nothing. (laughs) I did an awful lot of reading. I did an awful lot of writing. Uh, Kind of my normal routine, to be honest about it. I did take afternoons. Uh, to piddle around with one of my old cars. But other than that, my routine wasn't all that different. I just simply wasn't filming. And so uh, I I, I had plenty to do. I'm currently writing. uh, I'm finishing finishing up on an article in response to uh, a, um, well, he he calls me his friend. I'll call him my friend. Uh, His name is uh, Elton Holland. He is a noted scholar, uh, published scholar. Uh, He recently wrote an article critiquing covenant eschatology and espousing the futurist view. Very, very scholarly article. And so I've been, I have been writing a response to that. And since his, his article was presented in such a, an academic way, I wanted to present my response in an academic way. And, uh, Needless to say, it got a little bit out of hand lengthwise. I sent the article to William. He said it should have been a book uh, instead of an article. (laughs) So, uh, But that's the way it goes. Uh, I have abbreviated it, William, some since I sent it to you. I I have shortened it up considerably, but it's still plenty long. Uh, But anyway. It's excellent. Well, thank you. But in addition to that article, I have been writing another article which uses the first article as a springboard and the subject of this article is shame versus glory and eschatology it is a subject that's really really dear to me and that has become increasingly so over the years as i have continued to study it uh it is in my estimation one of the most ignored of all subjects related to eschatology and um I, you just don't hear anybody talking about it in some commentaries uh some of which i quote in this new article you have some scholars referencing shame versus glory but they never develop it in the way in a systematic way that i feel is the key to eschatology so anyway that's that's kind of what i've done what about your christmas and New Year's vacation. Well, well I go. just pretty much relaxed for the most part. Didn't go anywhere. Um, stayed in quiet, you know, with uh, Leora. And um, and that was pretty much it. You know, of course, I'm still working on, you know, a few studies. And you know, I've got the debate ahead of me in just a, f- a couple of weeks now, or less than two weeks, I think it is. But anyway, that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Well, it was a real good time for us. Unfortunately, when we got to Arkansas, our our granddaughter uh, came down with some kind of creeping crud respiratory junk, and naturally Jan caught it. And now we're home, and she's been in bed ever since we got home. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so naturally, we know what that means for Mr. Preston. <laughs> you know, I can see it on the horizon. I, I've been taking airborne. I've been taking this and that and the other to try to prevent it. But, you know, when you're breathing the same air in the same house as somebody that's sick, you're just about going to get it no matter what. So I'm really looking forward to that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hope it's not too severe if you do happen to uh, happen to catch it. Well, two days ago, Jan literally could not talk. Wow. I mean, she 
she would open her mouth and no, no sound would come out at all. Mm. Uh, yesterday, a little bit better today, a little bit better. All those one time today, I was in town running errands, mailing off some books and she called me and <clears throat> trying to talk to me about bringing home some breakfast. I couldn't understand her. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it was just, uh, Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, but she is feeling some better. The fever is broke. And so that's a good thing. So anyway, but we want to get back into second Corinthians, uh, chapter five, particularly, and, um, we want to develop more how second Corinthians chapters three through seven is Paul's midrash on Ezekiel chapter 37. This is such an exciting, it's such a rich study to see how Paul takes the themes, the words, the motifs that are found in Ezekiel 37 and the great prophecy of the restoration of Israel, the resurrection of Israel, and how Paul develops those themes in, and, and brings them to the forefront of an audience that he expected to understand exactly what he's saying, how he's applying the text. Uh, I was speaking with my good friend, Gerald Davis, on the phone today. Uh, Gerald, in my estimation, is an excellent scholar. I really appreciate his learning. I, I, I ask him Greek questions just every once in a while, and I appreciate the fact that he, he's done an awful lot of good reading. And he said that he was really appreciating how we're bringing out how Corinthians is Paul's midrash and how something in our background of the churches of Christ, you know, I made the comment, well, if you use the word midrash uh, in a fellowship meeting of our upbringing, people just look at you sideways or think you're as crazy or you're a heretic, you know, <laughs> uh, you just a midrash. What in the world's a midrash? Uh, and yet the more you study the new Testament, you realize that that is precisely what is taking place when the New Testament writers are quoting these Old Testament passages. They're giving their inspired interpretation, their inspired commentary on the true meaning of those Old Testament passages. So once a person taps into that and sees what's going on, it's really, really powerful. So William, we discussed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the nature, the identity of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. We discussed the corporate nature of that tabernacle, since it is a tabernacle not made with hands, and that terminology is used constantly, refer to the New Covenant temple, not the human body at all. We come now to a passage that, as you and I have discussed on many, many occasions, is really an incredibly important and incredibly powerful subject as it relates to eschatology. And I think greatly misunderstood even in the preterist community. And that's the doctrine of the last day's work of the Holy spirit. So Paul says, after speaking of, if this earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And in this we groan, Paul says, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be clothed with that building, which is of God. And so he discusses resurrection. He discusses the new tabernacle. And then he comes down in second Corinthians chapter five and verse six, <clears throat> pardon me. And he says, now we know, or the one who has prepared us for this very same thing is God who has also given us the earnest of the spirit as a guarantee. You know, William, I did not understand in, in the early days of my spiritual walk and my ministry even, the significance of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of the resurrection. I, in my early days, I certainly had no connection whatsoever with Ezekiel 37. Didn't have a clue in the world. But why don't you kind of walk us through the promise of Ezekiel 37 as it relates to the spirit and then bring us home into second Corinthians chapter five. Uh, lost you. <laughs> yeah. 
Nope. Well, William is still having that audio problem. All right. How's, how's there that? There you go. There okay. You. All right. So um, as you were saying, you know, it was somewhat of a mystery to you. Well, it was a mystery to me as well because I didn't have a clue of, you know, any connection and correlation between that and uh, an understanding of the Holy Spirit in reference to the, um, you know, resurrection. And yet when you begin to study eschatology, you see that very clearly, especially when you're studying it from the preterist view. Uh, it becomes very um, clear, at least uh, much greater to, in your awareness. In Ezekiel 37, um, you know, we have even from chapter 6 where he talks about he would put his spirit in you in verse 26, uh, 36 and 26. But when you look at the dry bones in chapter 37, he once again uh, mentions the spirit in verse 14, uh, 13 and 14, he says, Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So the spirit was uh, essential. It was necessary for God to raise them. And of course, putting them in the land in this uh, context is in essence putting them in the um, in the resurrection. Uh, the land uh, should be understood uh, primarily in terms of the fulfillment of this as Christ himself. And we have several passages in the New Testament that talk about the land. For example, Matthew 5, uh, blessed, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the land. Uh, you have Col Colossians 3 where you've done the book and you'll have to uh, give me the title again on that book, but that is a, a book that is dealing with the land uh, in Colossians 3. If then you were uh, raised with Christ, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth or the land from the perspective of Israel's land, but on the heavenly land, the land of the new tabernacle that was going to come down out of heaven. So you have that uh, in, in several of those places. And that's what it means. But uh, from that perspective of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, you have the prophecy of Joel, which, you know, people raise questions as to whether or not the Holy Spirit is a New Testament <laughs> promise. <laughs> <laughs> and that's rather interesting for, for those who, you know, claim to either talk a lot about it or, you know, well, they do talk a lot about it, but claim to know a lot about it. They seem not to know the origin of the prophecies related to the Holy Spirit, that it's from Joel chapter 2, uh, 28 through 32, and you even have text in, in Micah 7 and verse 15, which are uh, very important. But that text is speaking of what would take place in the last days, and that's the time frame for the resurrection of the dead. It's all happening in the last days. And uh, God has said in Ezekiel 37 that he's going to pour out his spirit. And so that's the reason and the, uh, the focus of the resurrection in not just Ezekiel 37, but in just about every resurrection text uh, that we find um, related to, you know, the eschatological resurrection, whether it's Romans 8, whether it's Ephesians chapter 1, um, 1st and Second Corinthians, even in other passages, uh, you have the Holy Spirit involved in those uh, in those texts. And so, in chapter five and verse five, <clears throat> when he says, "Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee," uh, we have the Spirit as a pledge, as the Arabon, um, for the consummation for the fulfillment of the resurrection and even for the process of it from the standpoint of its beginning, of its inception. And so that's very important. We cannot overlook that. And, and the idea of that is not that it's a non-miraculous indwelling at this time. We're talking about the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit, as we find in Joel's prophecy. Um, we're talking about the time in which this uh, would take place in the New Testament, and, and the text in Micah says that it was going to happen according to the 
days of your coming out of Egypt. So this is all during the second exodus that began with Jesus's death. When we look at the uh, uh, conversation with uh, him and Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says they spoke about his decease, which he would accomplish at Jerusalem. Well, that word decease is the word exodus. And so what we have is the beginning of the second exodus with Jesus's death and his exit out of that old covenant realm into the new covenant realm and, and the redemption that was being brought about as a result. So this is the framework for the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And that miraculous measure of the Spirit was only going to continue until the parousia, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. So if we have a resurrection paradigm that falls outside of those parameters in terms of the uh, days of your coming out of Egypt, uh, in terms of the parousia, and that's related to the resurrection. And, and I know you recall uh, the time that we had the discussion with um, uh, uh, Bill Lockwood and <laughs> and Stephen Wiggins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, um, they had a paper called Hammer and Tones. Right. And the whole core of that paper was Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32, and how it was to be fulfilled in the New Testament that it was the Holy Spirit's work from basically from Pentecost down to 70 AD. You know, as Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And that was their paradigm in the resurrection. That's right. However, they were affirming a future resurrection, but that resurrection was to be accomplished through what they argued very vociferously, very adamantly, and was the fact that the um, Holy Spirit was miraculous. But when they found out <laughs> <laughs> that it was the Holy Spirit that was to accomplish the resurrection, that gave them all kinds of problems. As a matter of fact, they didn't even want to uh, respond to some of the questions. But that's the core of it. Um, is that we have to see the work of the Holy Spirit uh, from the miraculous perspective and what Paul calls the earnest of the inheritance, which is resurrection, the coming of the kingdom, the parousia, and that work of the Holy Spirit has to be concluded. You know, I have one more story on that, unless you want to jump in here. I no, go ahead. Story. I've got some things I want to say naturally, but, but okay, go ahead. Sure. <laughs> and, and that one little story is the one I've told several times. And that was when I was in seminary at the good old Memphis School of Preaching. <laughs> I was in class one day and our instructor, who was the director of the school at the time, uh, was teaching from um, Franklin Camp's book. You know, yep. both of them have passed on now. But that book is The Work of the Holy Spirit in Redemption. And the basic premise of that book was that Joel's prophecy and Acts 2.38 was the miraculous and that it was fulfilled in 70 AD. Yep. And so we got to Romans chapter 8 in class that day. And I was kind of sitting at the back of the room that day for whatever reason. <laughs> um, there was only nine, eight or nine of us in class because, you know, we had a small class. And, uh, and I had been going through this back and forth with this, with this gentleman. If I called his name, I'm sure some people would know him. He, the last time I checked, uh, he was still around. But we were good, you know, good friends. But our doctrine, you know, we, we were m mortal enemies or <laughs> <laughs> as far as the doctrine was concerned. And, and of course, he, he really didn't like what I had to say about the coming of Christ. But anyway, I was in class that day, and uh, we got on Romans 8, 10, and 11, where it says, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead but um, uh, because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And it says, but if he who uh, raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then God will also make alive your mortal bodies through his spirit, which dwells in you. So I raised my hand, and I asked the question. I said, Brother Hearn, we are speaking of the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. And he said, yes. <laughs> and I said, well, if Paul said that it would be the work of the Holy Spirit 
that was presently indwelling the body in this text. I said, wouldn't that mean that the body would have to be raised before or by the time that the Holy Spirit's work was completed? And I tell you, Don, if there could have been <laughs> a window open, <laughs> I think he would have ran and jumped out of the window at that point. He did every kind of dance, took him about what seemed like 30 minutes to clear his throat was only a few seconds. And finally, he admitted, he said, yes. Wow. And when he said that, my buddy who was sitting at the front of the class spun around in his seat, his jaw dropped to the floor, and he looked straight back at me, and I had a grin on my face as, as big as Garfield, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but both of them got the point. Yep. And um, I thought it's it was inescapable. Yes, it was just a Kodak moment, you know, for that. But they sure. understood that, and he couldn't deny it. And, and one thing I did appreciate about it, he admitted that right in front of class. And yet, still considered me, you know, unsound, if you please, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the course of those things. But anyway, those are just a few things uh, about it. And I'm sure we'll have more to say as we move along. Oh, yeah, for sure. I would like for us to perhaps, and I, this, this may seem a little bit disjunctive, but it's actually quite important for what we want to talk about. We need to take a step back and realize that this promise of the Holy Spirit must be understood within the framework and context of the reality that from Malachi until the New Testament, what we call the New Testament period, the Holy Spirit was absent from Israel. The Lord withdrew the Spirit. There, there are all sorts of rabbinic quotes on this. Uh, scholars are well acknowledging this. Uh, men such as N.T. Wright, R.T. France. I mean, you just name it. Just about any noted scholar of the day, you, you can just, you can read their literature and they will all say that in Israel, there was the understanding that with the end of Malachi, with the, uh, with the end of that, pardon, with the end of that period of time, the Holy Spirit was withdrawn by God. There was no prophet after. Matter of fact, we do have in the writings of the Maccabees, in the time of John Hacrinus, he took the vessels of the temple and buried them, and he was on record as saying that those vessels would be hidden until a prophet would arise in Israel to tell them what to do with those vessels. So they understood, even during this very critical period of time of what we call the intertestamental period of time, they understood mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit was not present. So you have these Old Testament prophecies looking forward to the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They're looking beyond what, what we might call the dead period. They're looking beyond the period of time in which there was no prophetic word from Israel. You know, in Isaiah chapter 29, the Lord said, and he's talking about the 10 northern tribes here. And he says, I will close the eyes of Israel, that is the prophets. God took away the prophets from the 10 northern tribes. Okay. He did the same thing with the two southern tribes from the time of Malachi. Malachi is a really sad note to end the prophetic and the revelatory process under the Old Testament, because what do you have? You have seven debates between God and Judah and, it, and Jerusalem because of their abuse of the temple, because their mistreatment of the, of the widows and the orphans. And, and it's just a really sad testimony of the state of Israel. I'll use that term generically, state of Israel, specifically Judah and Jerusalem, in regard to the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, et cetera, et cetera. So no prophet. But here Joel said, it shall come to pass in the last days. I'll pour it my spirit. So the Jews understood, they realized that if the time came in which the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, that in which if, if the time came in which the prophetic office was revived in a true, genuine sense as it had existed with Daniel, as it has, had existed with Malachi and all of those Old Testament prophets, which they recognized as true prophets, they would know this is the last days. Mm -hmm. They would know the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. 
And there's an amazing prophecy in Isaiah chapter 32. We don't generally see it as uh, see it referred to near as much as an awful lot of uh, prophecies. And I would be the first to admit that the historical context may very well be uh, typological. But nonetheless, here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 1. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. Princes will rule with justice. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind, a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. The eyes of those who see will not be dim. The ears of those who hear will listen. Also, the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers will be ready uh, to speak plainly. So that, especially verse 3 and 4 here, is directly parallel to Isaiah chapter 35, which is most assuredly a messianic prophecy, you know, of the eyes being opened and et cetera, et cetera. But now notice this. Verse 12 and following, people will mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars, yes, on all the happy homes in the, in the joyous city, because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be deserted, the forts and towers will become lairs forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field. The fruitful field is counted as a forest. Now, now watch this. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness. Righteousness will reign in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace, the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. So here is language, by the way, especially down here in verse 10 and following, Paul echoes these verses directly. In Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is righteousness, holiness, peace, etc. So it makes one wonder if Isaiah chapter 32 should be considered just an overt prophecy uh, of the last days because of its relationship to Isaiah chapter 35 for certain. And the whole idea of Israel lying in waste until until the king arrives, who would reign in righteousness, until the Spirit is poured out. And when the Spirit is poured out, the fruit of the Spirit would be righteousness and peace and joy and these other attributes, which, to reiterate, Paul directly echoes in Galatians chapter 5. And he says, Do you not know that those who commit adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven? But the fruit of the Spirit is, and he lists these things right here. So in Galatians, which is a book in which Paul emphasizes the presence and work of the Holy Spirit in a very powerful way, as he writes to the Galatians, and he said, well, this only would I know of you. Having begun in the spirit, are you made perfect by the flesh? Those who worked miracles among you, do you suppose they did that by the works of the flesh? Or did they do that by the spirit? These are stark, powerful reminders to the Galatians. And let's not forget, many people believe, and I concur with this, Galatians is probably the very first of the epistles to be written somewhere around 49 AD. So here is Paul, again, giving this very powerful reminder of what, this, what the presence of the Holy Spirit in that miraculous measure, to reiterate the point that you made, we're talking about the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit here. The, any discussion of a non-miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not even on the table. That's not the subject. Because, again, Paul says, the one who works miracles among you, did he do it by the works of the law or by the Spirit? Well, they knew the answer to that. didn't happen under the old law. The Holy Spirit and the miraculous measure had been absent from, Spirit, from Israel for 400 years. So these not only historical but theology, theological realities really, really are powerful. And so I just think it needs to be emphasized and be brought to our mind how here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, 
where Paul says the one who, who created us for this very same thing is God who has also given us the Holy Spirit as the earnest of our inherit, earnest of this resurrection, of the guarantee of the resurrection. This is going back, as you've already pointed out, to Ezekiel 37. God was going to pour out his spirit to raise Israel from the dead. But the spirit would have been withdrawn from Israel for 400 years. I, I don't think, William, <clears throat> I think you and I have discussed this on many occasions. I don't think it's possible to overemphasize the impact of the day of Pentecost on well-read, astute Jews. They'd been waiting for the prophets to come, for the prophetic office to come. They'd been waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to let them know the day of the Lord is at hand. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, it's like, wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> How can we today properly appreciate that, properly express the fact that the presence of that Holy Spirit was proof positive that the great and terrible day of the Lord was at hand. That's why Peter said, quoting Joel, Spirit be poured out before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Peter says, he has shed forth this which you now see, see and hear. What have they seen and heard? Outpouring the Holy Spirit. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Why? Well, because that's the generation of the great and terrible day of the Lord of which the Holy Spirit in the miraculous measure was the sign. So that to me, getting that background of the absence of the Spirit for 400 years. And then as the old song goes, along came John. John did no miracle, but he was full of the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, according to Luke chapter one. What does that mean? <clears throat> right. Uh, let me back up and ask you a question from the text in um, verse 32. Yeah. In the latter verses, 18 and 19, do you see a dichotomy there between the old Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem in light of the coming of the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes. Because peace, <clears throat> Let, let's face it, Jesus said in John chapter 15, Peace I give to you, not the peace which the world gives, but my peace I give unto you. Philippians chapter 4, Paul said that the peace of God will pass understanding. So what, what is the keynote word in many respects of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It is peace. It is not worldly peace. It is peace between God and man. What was the situation of? between Israel and Yahweh under Torah. It was one of conflict. What was the what was the situation between Jerusalem and the nations under Torah? Warfare. And yet here here the old covenant's world, the old covenant kingdom in other words, was a kingdom in which they had to beat their plowshares into swords. They had to defend the kingdom, to spread the kingdom by the sword. Just read the story of David. Just even read the story of Solomon to a certain extent, although he was not the man of war that David was. But warfare and bloodshed was the way of the kingdom. Jerusalem was constantly under conflict, you know, constantly attacked. So now here God is promising that with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a new day is going to come, just like Isaiah chapter 2. They will beat their swords into plowshares. And people normally, unfortunately, they interpret that passage of saying, well, you know, when the kingdom is finally established, your debate opponent, the dispensationalist, he will go to that passage and say, oh, see, we still have war. Look at the Ukraine. Look at Israel right now. Look all around the world. We just got war going on, on everywhere. Do you see people beating their swords into plowshares, a time of peace? That fails to understand the contrast of the text. It is a contrast between the, the nature of the old covenant kingdom, which, to reiterate, was a kingdom that was established by the sword, that was defended by the sword, that was spread by the sword. The new covenant kingdom of Christ is a kingdom in which, as the Lord said to Peter, Peter, put up your sword. 
Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And so peace was a fleeting thing under Israel's history. Certainly it was the greatest under Solomon. But from Solomon onward, what do you have? Jeremiah or Jeroboam, Rehoboam. You have constant conflict, even between the northern and southern kingdoms and, and between the surrounding nations and what have you. But the peace that God gives is not a peace in which he promised that nation nations would never go to war again with one another. It is that the kingdom of God does not go to war because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold, bringing every imagination into captivity to the word, to the gospel of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So that's what I see going on here in, in Isaiah chapter 62. It's a time of peace, but it's a different kind of peace than Israel had ever existed. And the great city that would lie in peace is the new Zion. Yeah, I was looking at verse 19 where it says, though hell comes down on the forest and the city is brought low in humiliation. Um, to Jerusalem's. That's exactly, <laughs> that, that's exactly what I was seeing. So this time that the Holy Spirit is coming, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is when you have the two Jerusalem's existing, which is Galatians chapter four. All right. right. Paul says this is the uh, this Mount Hagar in Sinai is, you know, Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So that also tells you that this time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit has to be when national Israel was still in um, existence and therefore part of the covenant before the wrath of God had come on them, which is what Matthew 24 is all about. So we cannot take the work of the Holy Spirit, this miraculous work, outside of the setting and the framework of the two Jerusalems coexisting, which they did in the first century. Yeah. I know in, in my book, Who is This Babylon?, I developed the doctrine of the two Jerusalems, as is found throughout Scripture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I quoted a, a German scholar by the by the name of Hingstenberg, uh, he was the first that I was aware of that talked about it. And unfortunately, I lost that citation. But nonetheless, uh, he recognized that, for instance, in Zechariah 14, you've got a doctrine of two Jerusalems. You've got the city being taken, the uh, rifled, destroyed, the city going off into captivity, the women ravaged, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got Jerusalem uh, flowing out of Jerusalem is the river of life. And it's like, wait a minute, is it destroyed or not? <laughs> well, uh, it's not either or it's yes, it's both <laughs> yes. old covenant Jerusalem, as well, was pointing out from Galatians chapter four, the Jerusalem that stood in the first century, which, which was the center of the law, the focus of the law. And you have the new covenant, the new heavenly Jerusalem, which Paul said is the mother of us all. And you have that same contrast in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 14. We have here no abiding city. Well, for a Jew to say that, <laughs> I mean, it's like, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Who are you talking? Wait a minute. What are you talking about? What do you mean we don't have a, here an abiding city? Jerusalem is the eternal city, supposedly. But no, throughout the Old Testament, God foretold the destruction of physical Jerusalem in the last days and the creation of a new Jerusalem. And so all of this plays directly into this. And these are all some of the, some of the reasons why when I look at Isaiah chapter 37, I see it as, although it's couched in a time of oppression of the physical Jerusalem, although, although at the time of Isaiah chapter 31, okay, the time of Sennacherib's invasion of the land of Israel, he destroyed 46 cities. He bottled Hezekiah up in, in Jerusalem. But guess what? When it says here in chapter 32, uh, though hail comes down on the forest and the city is brought low, Jerusalem was not destroyed under Sennacherib. That's Ezekiel chapter 37. What happened? Well, the angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians, killed 185,000 of them. Sennacherib went back home and was worshiping his God when his two sons killed him. 
and took over the throne. Jerusalem was not destroyed at the time of Sennacherib. So it was, Jerusalem wasn't brought low, defe defeated and humiliated at the time of Ezekiel 32. Ezekiel 32 seems like it's a, I don't like to use the word parenthetical, but it is a prophecy in the midst of the doom and the gloom uh, of, the, of the siege under Sennacherib to say the time is coming. And if commentators try to make the king of righteousness to be Hezekiah, he was already ruling. He was the ruler in Jerusalem at the time of Sennacherib. So you can't say, well, you know, a, a future king is coming. Because Hezekiah was one, of the, <laughs> he was one of the very last few kings of righteousness in in Jerusalem. I mean, from from Hezekiah on, it was basically downhill. I mean, you know, it was not really good. So I have trouble fitting Hezekiah into chapter thirty two, verse one. I see it pointing forward to Messiah and so much of the rest of the chapter, and especially since, especially since Paul echoes about the fruit of the spirit there in the, in these verses of uh, verse 18 and following. So I, I just think it's an incredibly powerful text uh, since so many of the themes are found in the, in the, the new text in the new Testament. So I hope that helped. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. I mean, I think that the correlation and that uh, um, distinction between the two cities is powerful in that context. And that, flows right into second Corinthians chapter five and dealing with the two houses, the two, the temples in the two cities, et cetera. So there's your habitation. You have a tabernacle um, is supposed to be dissolved. One. That's correct. Eternal. That's right. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, I don't know what the right word is. It's bifurcation between the old covenant body, the new covenant body, the old covenant temple, new covenant temple, what have you, uh, as we've already stated on this program, uh, it's found throughout scripture. I mean, you, you can just, uh, I made a chart one time between the physical realities of the old covenant mm -hmm. of the, the land, the city, the temple, the circumcision, the, the priesthood, the sacrifices on and on and on versus the spiritual realities of Jesus Christ. And you can do the same thing here <clears throat> with the subject of this, of this discussion. So William, we come back to second Corinthians chapter five. And I really think, uh, let, let's look at this even closer and its importance in regard to the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit and the consummation of eschatology and, and the problems that causes for cessationists who say, oh, well, uh, no, miracles ended, some say in 96, 98, 100 uh, A.D., you know, in the reign of Domitian, others say, well, they ended, okay, yeah, they ended uh, in 70 A.D., but we're still looking for the resurrection. Seems to me there's a huge problem there. Yes, that's a colossal problem. Um, there just will not be uh, a miraculous measure of the Spirit to raise any bodies uh, particularly because they focus on, you know, physical uh, body resurrection from that perspective. And, uh, or they've got to demand that the Holy Spirit, you know, be re-instituted um, or that that time or that period be reinstituted. And, uh, and on the other hand, those who claim that it's still here, they got a problem with trying to show us a real miracle to demonstrate that there are any miracles. And so that is so problematic in every aspect of um, uh, applying the work of the spirit to some time beyond um, that given in uh, in the scriptures uh, relating to the coming of Christ. I remember early on uh, when I shared uh, a text from 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8, with an individual, uh, and we were talking about, you know, the coming of Christ, et cetera. So I, I just said, well, look, I'm going to take the Pentecostal position on this. You know, I'm going <laughs> I'm going to say that the um, the gifts and the miracles, et cetera, continued all the way until the coming of Christ. And, uh, of course, you know, from our fellowship, we had two basic views on when these gifts ceased. And that was either, um, uh, you know, they would say at the coming of the perfect, and then they would sometimes define that as when the last man whom the apostles laid hands on would die. 
And so you you don't have it there. But so I, I took that position in First Corinthians 1, 6 and says, look, uh, if the coming of Christ is still future, you know, I, I believe the miracle is still there. And so I asked the God to disprove it. And uh, and he really had a problem. I mean, he just finally just it was almost like he broke out in a sweat. He didn't do it literally, but <laughs> you could see the exasperation that he had gone through trying to figure that out. And finally, he says, William, I can't do it. He says, what's the answer? And uh, and when I shared the answer with him that evening, he um, he became a preterist that day just from that particular <laughs> scripture and um another example i'll, I'll give from that is uh, well, experience was um billy williams oh yes uh, uh, i think it was his name wasn't it yes. Uh, yes yes okay and he lived in memphis he used to debate our brethren all the time i remember one time i think he had a debate with bill lockwood right here in, I in think memphis. that's correct yeah but at any rate uh he was a penal cost of preacher and um Somehow we began to communicate, and I still have letters of our conversation in my in my files. But anyway, we were talking about these passages like Matthew 28, 20, um, 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8, and uh, Ephesians 4, 30, et cetera, all of the ones that, you know, we use to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so uh, he had been debating for years the very point that I was making. He was a good debater. Uh, yeah, yeah. The other thing about it, he was a real nice guy. Yes, know, he was. I corresponded at, with him so myself. Yeah, at the time that I spoke with him, he was having problems with his legs, and so he was kind of laid up in the bed. But he was, you know, we had very jovial conversation, and I was still working at the time, uh, you know, working with FedEx. And so we spoke on the phone one afternoon, and um, and I got to those passages that he was dealing with, and, you know, he was saying this happened at the coming of Christ, and then I started taking him to the passage that says this was going to continue until the end of the age and pointed out that that was the, you know, the age of Moses, et cetera. And he said, I've never seen that before. He says, no one has ever raised that issue with me before. And uh, he says, I'll tell you what, he says, I don't know that I necessarily agree with you. He said, but I have no answer for that. Hmm. And that was a big statement coming from somebody who had debated you know, <laughs> these brethren all these years about that. But that just shows you how important it is for us to get this correct in terms of the work of the spirit and uh, the um, interconnection between the work of the spirit and the resurrection, it's just, just vital. You can't have one without the other. Well, it's exactly right. And I'll tell a real quick anecdote here as we're closing down. Uh, some years ago, a uh, local church of Christ minister was going to debate a Pentecostal preacher at Lone Grove, just west of me. And, um, the local minister had used me as a whipping boy on several different occasions from his, <laughs> from his pulpit. You know, I was the local, uh, quote, antichrist, unquote, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was the chief heretic in Southern Oklahoma and what have you. Well, the, uh, the Pentecostal minister, I, I, I knew of him and I contacted him and I said, I want to share something with you. And I said, I'm doing this in the interest of truth. I said, I'm not a Pentecostal. And I said, I disagree with you, but I also disagree with your opponent. And I said, I would like to see how your opponent, my church of Christ brother would respond to this. So he's, and of course you could tell he was rather defensive. He thought maybe I was setting him up for a fall. I yeah. wasn't, uh, but nonetheless, I said in revelation chapter 11, we have the story of two witnesses. They are prophets. Prophets means they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Right. I said, now, your opponent and from the churches of Christ does not believe that the prophetic office still exists today. It ceased to exist in the first century and does not believe that it will ever be revived. Yet, he believes that the two prophets referred or, and or the city where the Lord was crucified was Rome, which didn't fall until 486 BC or AD, excuse me. So I said, you need to ask him, when did the pro prophetic office cease? Well, bless his heart, he did, he didn't catch the he didn't catch the power of that argument. I had to repeat it a couple of times. Your opponent believes that Babylon is Rome. Rome fell in 486 AD, 
But here, the two witnesses lie in the street of the great city Babylon until they're resurrected. But they're prophets who prophesy until the time of the destruction of that city or immediately before it. So that means that the prophetic office had to last until 486 AD. Well, he finally caught it. He refused to use the argument. But he told the Church of Christ minister about it. And the Church of Christ minister had to get up and say, well, there's a man here tonight named Don Preston. He's sitting right down there. And he, di he did the following. I just grinned. I thought it was absolutely hilarious. And I went up to him afterwards. I said, you didn't answer the problem. You know the problem. Mm -hmm. You didn't answer the problem. And he wouldn't, wouldn't say a word. Absolutely wouldn't say a word. But folks, I say that, and it is a humorous story, but it illustrates the real significant problem. As William and I have been pointing out, the Holy Spirit was to be given as a guarantee of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit would be given until the resurrection. Just like you give earnest money <clears throat> until you close on the purchase of a building, a house, etc. You don't get the earnest back before the deal. <laughs> okay. So the earnest of the spirit would be given until the day of the redemption of the purchased possession. Ephesians 1, 12 and 13. Holy Spirit, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit until the resurrection. If you put the resurrection into our future, then you're saying one of two things. Number one, the charismatic gift of the Holy Spirit continues today, or as Williams already pointed out, the charismatic gift of the Holy Spirit will be revived. And by the way, it's not just to do the resurrection. It is to empower prophets immediately before the resurrection. Because that's what those prophets in Revelation do. They testify for 42 months. Well, that's approximately three and a half years. That's correct. <clears throat> so this is extremely, extremely problematic. For those who believe the, the prophetic office have seized such men, by the way, such as Kenneth Gentry, men such as Gary DeMar. Now, it's interesting to me, I don't know if you're even aware of this or not, William. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that Ed Stevens now says he can't deny that the Holy Spirit may still be operative in the gifts of the Spirit today. Well, I don't know that I've heard him say that specific statement, but I have heard him before uh, reference the fact that he believes that the Holy Spirit is still operative. So, yeah, I've heard that. Well, I have him on record to that effect. Yeah, yeah. And, and so <clears throat> uh, th this goes back to the issue, as, as William was pointing out. And by the way, this is so ironic. There, There is, I don't know how significant it is, but there are a group of those who call themselves preterists. There's a Facebook page entitled uh, Charismatic preterism. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, but go ahead. Well, I mean, it, it's it's a reality. So here are those, here are individuals, and I know some of them, they're wonderful people. They're great people, uh, very zealous. Historically, they always made the argument, miracles will last until the day of the Lord. Yes, true granted miracles will end at the day of the Lord. That's William, how long has that been the traditional argument of the charismatic Pentecostal movement? It's been as long as I've ever known. In, in every debate book I've ever yes. read, in every Pentecostal book I've ever read, that is the fundamental argument. So now we have this group of people who call themselves charismatic preterists who say, oh, well, <clears throat> yeah, the Lord came, but now we've got miracles. Uh, John Noe, before he went off into what he calls idealism, said, well, you see, the point of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, now we know in part, we prophesy in part, and he would set a cup out on the pulpit that was half full. And he would say, now see, <clears throat> what Paul's saying is here, now we know in part, the cup's half full. The cup half full is miracles. But when that which is perfect is cup is come, we have the full. We have greater measure of miracles. Of course, when I challenged John to perform a miracle, <laughs> he, he refused to even try. And uh, when I asked him if the prophetic office had ceased, he said, yes, 
but that doesn't mean that miracles have ceased. Wow. So the inconsistencies here are really dramatic. And again, what I started to say a moment ago, the irony is that we have these people, individuals, and again, wonderful people, claim to be charismatic preterists who historically, traditionally argued miracles would end at the day of the Lord, yet now they're arguing that miracles haven't ended at the day of the Lord at all, even though the day of the Lord did come in AD 70. And to me, I find that to be one of the most inconsistent, uh, easily disproven arguments that could possibly be made. Uh, you pointed out a moment ago, one of the problems with those who talk about modern day miracles is they can't produce them. That's a, that's a major problem. Yeah, it is. And it, um, just shows you how easily sometimes people can be deceived. You know, you're, I suppose the group that you're talking about, um, would be Pentecostals. Is, is that correct? The charismatic Pentecostal? Yeah. I, I didn't know for sure because I, I'm sure that there are some who may not have associated themselves with Pentecostals who still believe miracles, you know, exist, you know, like you say, Ed Stevens. And, and so I think that there are some others as well, but yeah, I, I've known some notable ones that, you know, I used to talk to all the time about um, the coming of the Lord having been fulfilled. And uh, and I don't know whether it's because they think that they need to do this in order to maintain their influence with the audience, et cetera, because there's so many people out there who believe it, mm -hmm. uh, believe that these these gifts continue. And so they allow themselves to be deceived by it from that perspective. And I've, I've had people, uh, you know, have very strong um uh, emotional attachment to that. Well, how can you say that there's no miracle? I said, well, the only way I can say it is because of what the Bible says. And um, how are you going to say then that the Bible uh, doesn't mean what it says when it says these things will continue until the end of the age and until the coming of Christ and Christ has come. But uh, yeah, you, you have this group of, of, you know, charismatic people who hold that position. And of course, there are some others even outside of that group who do so for whatever reason. And I know that there's such a strong appeal um, to this sort of emotional experience of, you know, feeling either they can speak in tongues or they can uh, heal and raise people. Uh, you know, I, I would think if they had that kind of power, you know, we wouldn't have to have all these medicine bottles. You wouldn't have to have all these hospitals, <laughs> at least uh, not to the degree that we have them. And certainly in, in cases where, you know, something was needed in, in order to demonstrate it, they ought to be able to do one miracle, but, uh, but they haven't. And, and what's funny about that is the people who have made such claims, they'll come back and tell you, and, and I'm talking about the ones who have really uh, deceived people with it. They'll come back and tell you that they're using all kinds of tricks and everything and deceiving people uh, in the beginning. And yet people still believe it. You know, this particular study has been one that I've had a passion for, for most of my, <clears throat> most of my ministerial life. I mean, I've studied a lot of things in depth, but the, but the issue of the charismata is one that I've spent countless, countless hours investigating and studying. I've studied with countless numbers uh, of charismatic Pentecostal preachers and members as well. I'll share one quick story and then we'll be out of time. Years ago, when I was still at Shawnee, uh, I ran a newspaper article every week. I ran a series on miracles and why I believe that they have ceased. <clears throat> I got into the office on a, on a Monday morning and my phone was ringing when I walked in and this guy was, is this a Don Preston? You do the article. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he blasted me. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> you say there are no miracles. I want to tell you right now, there are miracles and you're wrong and you're going to go to hell and uh, blah, blah, blah. And, and he finally settled down and I said, well, let me ask you a question. Would you be willing to study this from the Bible? He said, of course I will. So we set up a time. I went to his house <clears throat> and we really, we started talking. And I said, now, before we really get into it, I said, let's define a miracle. So I began to explain what a miracle is biblically defined, mm -hmm. not in one of the playoff games, football games over the weekend, a play was made and, and the commentators, that's just a miracle. Uh, no, <laughs> not really a miracle. 
<clears throat> so anyway, as I had defined it, the guy says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, well, wait a minute. That's not what I'm talking about. Well, his wife had had cancer. She had gone to all the doctors, taken all the medicines, taken all the treatment. After about three or four years of treatment, she was declared cancer free. And he says, that's a miracle. I just said, look, let's be thankful for her healing. Wonderful. That's I said, I'm not di disparaging or depreciating that. We can be thankful for that. Mm -hmm. But is that a miracle in which, and by the way, he had taken her to Oral Roberts campaigns, you know, prayers and all this kind of stuff. Nothing ever happened. <clears throat> so I said, a biblical miracle is when a man placed his hands on someone with leprosy or palsy or epilepsy or whatever, blindness, deafness. And they were instantly healed. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, I'm not saying that. I said, well, that's why I wanted to start with defining a miracle. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, no, those miracles ended long, long, long time ago. I said, then we agree. <laughs> <laughs> so it's extremely, extremely important that we define our terms. And people ask me, they ask you all the time, well, if you don't believe miracles, why do you pray? Well, it's because I believe in the power of God. That doesn't mean I believe that God is working miracles today. I've seen the power of prayer in my life. I've seen the power of prayer exhibited to me, not miraculously, but providentially in situations where the doctors had basically almost given up and yet the people recovered. That to me is a powerful illustration of the power of prayer. It's not a miracle because the doctors continue to do their work and, and et cetera, et cetera. Let so, me throw this one little point in there yeah. real quick. Uh, one thing that's very powerful is the statement that's made in John 20, where he talks about the miracles that are written. And J.W. McGarvey really impressed that on me with his Christian Evidences book, that the fact that Jesus said, these are written that you might believe. So if people think they got to have, you know, a miracle performed by someone in order to produce faith, the whole point of your faith is so that you can obtain eternal life. And All if right. you can read a written miracle to do that, why do you need anything else beyond it? Anyway. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's good a good point. Well, look, William, we're out of time. Been another great show. Appreciate it so very much. Been great to have you back on. I guess we'll have Daniel back next week, and we'll pick up on our discussion of the, of the Messianic Temple. All of this has been related to it. But nonetheless, thanks again for joining me. It's been great. Oh, it's my pleasure. Good been to be great. with you. All right. Good night. All right.